Thank you all for joining us today uh, for the first of what we're looking forward to as a series of engagements uh, with our friends from our barometers to look at their, uh, the latest polling data that they have uh, done, which ran from, uh, from 2020, uh, to 2021 to 2022, uh, July, uh, and, uh, and covers a number of, of different issues. Today, we're going to be talking with Michael Robbins about the international relations aspect of the, uh, the polling data. Uh, in subsequent weeks, uh, we're going to also cover economy, uh, gender, and climate change. So uh, we'll have an opportunity to drill down with uh, Michael and the Arab Barometers team about a lot of the uh, interesting issues that they have, uh, that they've been able to generate uh, over their uh, surveys. I'm also delighted that today we are joined by John Alterman, our old friend from CSIS and the uh, Brzezinski uh, Global Security Chair. And Geostrategy. And Geostrategy, yes. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, Marissa Horma, uh, who is the Director of the Middle East Program at the Wilson Center. Uh, and uh, we will begin with Michael making his presentation uh, and uh, we will follow with a discussion after that uh, we will uh, be taking questions from the audience uh, later on in the program. Uh, so those of you who are here in person uh, will be able to ask your questions. And also uh, we will be able to take questions from the audience watching virtually uh, Faria, through the chat function, through the chat function. So, uh, so with that, let me uh, turn it over to Michael and uh, we will begin our presentation. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you to everyone who's here in uh, person and who's uh, watching online. Really glad to be able to share these findings with you and are excited to release the wave. And, and thank you certainly to, uh, to MEI for all the uh, work to put together these conferences. We're really excited and thank you to the panelists as well. Uh, I'm here to talk about the, the findings of uh, the new wave of the Arab barometer uh, on international relations. Um, and so to give you a bit of, to give you a bit of uh, background on it, we, uh, the Arab barometer is the longest standing and largest repository of publicly available data on ordinary citizen views in the Middle East and North Africa. We've been tracking views of citizens since 2006 with the goal of, uh, of providing insight into changes over time. We really have three key goals. The first is to track attitudes and behaviors of citizens. The second is to build institutional capacity. Um, it's something that we really focus on trying to work with teams in the region to increase the ability to do this type of work so that not only ourselves, but other researchers can, can work with them and, and, act, and uh, conduct accurate and uh, reliable surveys. The final is what we're doing here, which is to disseminate the knowledge about uh, how people think across the region um, to inform civil society, government, and international organizations. Um, to give you a bit of detail about the project, today we've done more than 125,000 interviews um, across 87 nationally representative surveys. Um, we have, we have uh, actually now this is the seventh wave. Previously, we've done six waves, um, uh, providing trend data on how views have changed, and all our data are publicly available for analysis at arabbarometer.org. Um, the seventh wave itself uh, includes 12 national representative surveys of citizens ages 18 plus. I'm only able to present data on 10 of those, unfortunately, because we couldn't ask uh, the, these questions in a, a couple of countries, and we can talk about that later. All these were conducted in person in the respondent's place of residence. It was a complex survey design, typically stratified by government urbanity. What that really means is that these uh, interviews are spread across the country, so it's nationally representative. Everyone in every governorate and or essentially all the governorates in each country had a chance to be included, so roughly an equal probability of selection. They're fielded from October 2021 to July of 2022, and the response rates vary from uh, about 17% to 74%, depending on the country. And each of these was fielded by a local team in each country. So it was a, a local set of, of researchers in each country who did the uh, actual field work. So to present the kind of key findings, then we'll get into the data. Um, so overall, China does remain more popular than the United States across the Middle East and North Africa. However, support for China does appear to be on the decline based on the, on the trends that we're seeing. 
Um, overall, President Biden's policies are significantly more favorable than, uh, than former President Donald Trump's. And so we are seeing a bit of a change perhaps in the US as a result from uh, the change of administrations. There's actually very little knowledge of the Uyghur issue across the Middle East, Middle East and North Africa. So this is something that comes up fairly frequently about thinking about views of China. And it is something that doesn't necessarily seem to be having a significant effect at this time. Um, we also did an expansive view of kind of thinking about what some have termed China Inc. Um, and kind of the idea that China is moving in economically to the area with some of the businesses. What we find is that it's not necessarily likely to help China's overall image based on the, uh, the way that people think about uh, these issues. Um, moving on to a few other actors, we do find that the support for Russia is limited um, and that uh, it's far below Turkey or Saudi Arabia in the region. And finally, normalization with Israel is broadly rejected, except in Sudan and Morocco, which is a kind of an interesting finding that I'll detail. So first, looking at the global powers, um, when we look at the favorability of the United States versus China, what we see on the whole is that in, in all but one country is about half or more uh, favor, have a favorable view towards China. The exception is Palestine, and in this case, it's only about a third, but elsewhere there is fairly strong support for China, including 67% in Algeria, 64% uh, Morocco, and 63% Mauritania. In comparison, the U.S. is not quite uh, as highly favored, and overall, in only, about, uh, in only four of the countries do half or more say they have a positive view of the United States. Uh, and in general, the views of the United States on average fall somewhere in the, the, the mid 40s. So China is, uh, is in a sense viewed more favorably overall than the United States. If we look at uh, how Biden is, the views of Biden's policies versus Xi's, what we see is something uh, relatively similar. In a, a way, uh, pre Chinese President Xi Jinping's policies are, are viewed less positively than China overall. It may in some ways be because people are less familiar with him or some are, are not as familiar. But we do see that in, in general, um, he's a slightly more popular than, than those of uh, President Biden. But overall, there, there is a gap here between uh, his ratings uh, and, and that of, of China, and as well as the United States, that, that Biden is, is not necessarily as favored, but it is um, relatively close and on average. And Biden is somewhere around 35% in the region, and, and perhaps uh, she is, is the median country is about 39%. However, there is a bigger story here and something that we've tracked a bit longer than just the overall views of the country um, or favorability is the economic relations with uh, the two countries. And so what we see here is that there's actually a bit of a, a closer relationship. So in the United States, we see that in the median country, about 46% say that they actually want closer economic ties with the United States. And this is something that's been relatively flat or has perhaps increased in most of the countries that we've surveyed. And so you can see here on the right, just a selection of the countries we see that it's been relatively stable or perhaps gone slightly up uh, in, a, in a case like Tunisia. Um, if we turn to China, however, what we've actually seen is some, somewhat different. So an, an average on China, the median country here is about 48% support for uh, closer economic ties with China. We have seen a decline, and this is something that you can look at in the case of Jordan, that it's fallen by about 20 points over the past, uh, over the past three or four years. And this is something we see in other countries. In Palestine, it's also fallen by 20 points. And in a number of other countries, it's fallen by 10 points. So there does seem to be a, a, a reluctance to, uh, to have closer economic relations with China. And this is certainly on the decline and, and something we've seen uh, in a, a lot of the data across the region. And I should say, we have a report out that details each of the countries on this. And, and so you can certainly look there. We could talk more in Q&A. Um, if we think about some of the things that may be defining the U.S. or may have led to uh, differences in views of the United States, what we see is that uh, President Joseph Biden's or Joe Biden's policies are significantly more favorable um, than, than Donald Trump's. In this case, there's uh, there's no country that uh, that um, that he's less favorable in overall, and in some countries he's significantly more favorable. Um, on average, again, somewhere around uh, 30. 34, 35 percent in the median country compared to Donald Trump, who was in the low te uh, teens uh, overall in the, the median country. Um, but a lot of this is actually driven by the degree to which Biden is not necessarily known yet. So if we look at this, just as just one country, Tunisia, but most of the other countries are actually relatively similar. We see that about almost four in 10 say that they don't have enough to say yet about uh, Joe Biden's foreign policies. Uh, whereas with Donald Trump, 40% said that they were very bad and 29% they're bad, which is much lower for Joe Biden. So in a sense, the Biden administration still, even a, a couple of years into his administration, doesn't necessarily seem to be that well known uh, by public and Mena, and a lot of the, their views are still being, uh, being determined about uh, how he may act going forward. One of the other things that the United States is certainly associated with now is the push for normalization with Israel. And so we asked questions about the degree to which people are, uh, are supportive of normalization with Israel. And what we find across the region is that in most countries, fewer than uh, one in 10 say that they actually are supportive of this. There are really two key exceptions, though, which are Morocco and Sudan. 
And in both these countries, at least three in 10 say that they support this. And notably, these are the two countries that have actually, out of this list, that have pursued normalization with Israel. Uh, in the case of Sudan, 39% say that they are supportive and in response to normalization or the start of the process, they were removed from the US, state or list, the US list of state sponsors of terror. And in the case of Morocco, um, the United States recognized Western Sahara. So our sense is that this may be somewhat of a strategic uh, view by, by people in these countries. And you can particularly see this on the right where we look at those who have a higher level of education, those with at least a college degree, uh, in Morocco, over half, or about half, 52%, say that they're supportive of this. In uh, Sudan, 46% say they're supportive, which is much higher than those who have a lesser degree. So it may be people who've really thought about this and the benefits that it accrued um, were leading to this, um, this decision. And, and elsewhere, we generally see a, a lower level of support. So generally, normalization is, is widely rejected, but in the countries that have something, um, perhaps a benefit from it, there, there is um, significantly higher support. That said, I think it's also noteworthy that Jordan and Egypt, two of the countries that do have peace uh, treaties with Israel from a generation ago, only 5% in both countries say that they're actually supportive of this. So it is something that perhaps as this, um, if, if Sudan and Morocco were to follow the same path, it may be something that the strategic calculations kind of disappear or, or you know, lessen in people's minds that it, it may actually go down over time, but we'll have to continue tracking this to see. One of the other things that we've thought about is trying to think about how people view China. And so one of the questions is, is there a sense of the Uyghur issue, uh, which are a Muslim minority in, in the Western part of the country? Is this potentially a, something that's limiting support for China in the region or might be something that, that would be negatively associated? We find is that in almost all countries surveyed, a third or fewer say that they're following the news uh, at this to any degree. Those with a higher level of education are somewhat more likely to say that they're following it to, to some extent. But again, it's a, it's a minority of people across the country. So it doesn't seem like this is something that's particularly um, well known in, in most of the countries uh, in, in the region. So thinking more about kind of China's economic engagement in the region, um, one of the, the questions we do ask is, is whether um, the development of the United States economic power and the development of China's economic power are perceived as threats. And one of the interesting things we find is that the United States is perceived as a greater threat to the region than China. And given China's engagement and trade with the region, that may seem somewhat surprising, but there is a greater fear of the United States uh, overall. And, and, uh, and only in Morocco is, is do fewer than a third say the United States is a threat, whereas um, in all countries we surveyed, fewer than a third say that China's economic power is a critical threat. So there does seem to be a sense that China is not necessarily a huge threat at this point um, to the region economically. Um, however, we ask a, a series of questions about if a, a foreign country's uh, if a company from a foreign country were coming in to build a project, what are your perceptions of uh, how that of who would build certain types of products? And so the first one we ask is about the quality of the project. What co uh, company from which country would build the highest quality project out of a list of, uh, of five countries? So Germany, the United States, Turkey, China, and, and the colonial power of that country. We find, perhaps unsurprisingly, that broadly speaking, German engineering is well respected as, as being the highest quality. It comes across at the top generally followed by the United States, and with China coming somewhat below that. So certainly um, the United States and Germany are viewed as building higher quality products. When we ask about the lowest quality product, this is where China really comes through. In all countries we surveyed, this is viewed as building the lowest quality projects. So certainly the, the brand name of, of Chinese companies is not particularly strong, that there is a sense that it will build uh, a project that is, is somewhat worse um, than, than the other uh, countries. When we ask about not paying bribes, uh, one of the things that we see is that the United States and Germany tend to pop this, but there's actually a fair amount of disagreement. There's not really a consensus on who would necessarily do the cleanest bidding for the project and, and perhaps pay the, the fewest bribes. Um, when we ask about the treatment of local people, um, who would treat the local workforce the best in terms of paying the best salary, we see the United States and Germany again top the list here, that the United States tends to come out across, perhaps thinking about um, you know, the, the, the general wealth of the United States or the companies and perceptions of that, but it does come out ahead overall, um, generally with, with Germany and a few countries as well. And, and China is somewhat uh, lower. In most of the countries it's, that we surveyed, it's fewer than one in 10 with a couple of countries, say Morocco at 16%, Iraq 15%, but still relatively low for a sense that it would treat the local workforce the best in terms of salary. So finally, we ask about the overall preference. Who would you want to, uh, to get the contract? And what we see here is that, that um, in Iraq, China comes out ahead slightly ahead of the United States, but elsewhere it's really Germany or the United States tends to be the country that's most preferred if there was a, a company bidding for a foreign contract. China comes out well below this in most countries. In Mauritania, only 17%, in Jordan, 10%. 
Uh, so something that isn't necessarily as the Belt and Road Initiative is going and, and pushing a development here, it isn't necessarily something that, um, at least from these data, suggests that it's likely to benefit China as much as people are more engaged and, and perhaps see this because there's not necessarily a strong brand name for Chinese companies in, uh, across the region. And so again, trying to think about how people are thinking about China relative to other competitors, um, that's, that's one of the, the findings we have from this wave. So let me move on briefly to talk about uh, some of the other powers, just to give you a view of, of, of other uh, countries in the region and how they're, they're thought of. Um, the first we asked about the favorability of Russia. And so we did this, most of these surveys were done um, actually before the war in Ukraine. There was a survey in Jordan that was done during the war in Ukraine, um, but overall, most of it was done prior. And what we see is that in, on average, uh, about four in 10, a little over four in 10, say they have favorability towards Russia, Algeria being the highest given their strong historical links with Russia, that makes sense, two thirds there, about 52% Lebanon, but elsewhere half or fewer say that they have a favorable view of Russia. And I should note that in the case of Jordan where we did the survey during the, it was two thirds of it was done before the fielding or before the invasion of Ukraine and a third after, we didn't see a significant difference between the two. So it may have been too soon to really uh, take stock yet um, given the newness of this, or it, it may not have had a significant effect overall and we can potentially talk about that more in Q&A. Um, in terms of Putin himself, um, we see, again, slightly lower views of Putin. Again, we generally see this for world leaders, but overall, about on average, about a third say that, uh, that they have a positive view of, of Putin in the average country of, of these uh, 10 countries that we surveyed. In terms of economic ties with Russia, we've seen, again, relative stability overall. Um, that on average, again, about four in 10 say they want closer economic relations with Russia. And this hasn't in these four countries, and this holds for most of the region, really changed all that dramatically over the past uh, six years. So this does seem to be something that's relatively constant, and this does reflect what we've seen in Russia um, in terms of ties with Russia in the previous years. Um, in terms of Turkey and Erdogan, we, uh, we see he's that Turkey tends to be the most popular, not in all countries, in a place like Libya. Um, or Iraq, it tends to not be as, as supported. But again, in, in uh, six of the 10 countries we have surveyed here, two thirds or more say the positive view of Turkey. Um, again, if we had a different set of countries that may not uh, entirely hold, but it is something that um, we do see typically is, is very strong support for Turkey as well as its president. In this case, in five, half the countries we surveyed, at least six in 10 say the positive view of Erdogan um, and his foreign policies towards the region. Uh, in terms of closer economic ties with Turkey, we do see some movement here. Um, overall, it's, it's fairly warm with, uh, again, in half the countries, at least half want closer economic ties. We've seen a bit of a decline in Tunisia over the time, a bit of a decline in Morocco, perhaps over time. So it does seem like this is potentially going down slightly um, in terms of the, the overall views of Turkey may be declining a bit, uh, perhaps given their own challenges at home at this point. But uh, it is something that remains relatively strong. In terms of the, Saudi, the favorability of Saudi Arabia and Mohammed bin Salman, um, we see that, again, a relatively strong support in, uh, in six of the 10 countries, at least half say that they have a positive view of Saudi Arabia. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman is somewhat lower. Uh, in this case, only in three of the countries do half or more say they have a positive view of his foreign policies. Um, but again, uh, more popular typically than uh, the United States, Russia, um, and, and, and so on. So it is, it is something that uh, we do see relatively strong ratings still for Saudi Arabia. In terms of closer economic ties, the story is relatively similar. In about half the countries, we see uh, half or more saying that they want stronger economic relations, although we have seen this decline in, in most countries over time. In Tunisia, it's increased a bit since the last survey. But in Jordan, there's been a long-term decline from 78% to 54%. In, uh, in uh, Morocco, it's slid from 70% to 40%. So we do see some indications that, that there may be a, a decrease in the desire for closer relations with Saudi Arabia over the, the periods of the survey. And finally, we do ask a few questions about Iran. And just as a comparison, we include Saudi Arabia here to think about the challenges, particularly in countries that have perhaps a mixed population sectarian differences to think about the differences here. And one of the interesting things is in all the countries we survey, we see that Iran is viewed as a, a bigger threat to the region, um, as a critical threat to the region compared with Saudi Arabia. So even a country like Iraq, um, we see that 75% say that they view uh, Iran as a, a threat compared to 40% who say the same about, um, about Saudi Arabia. And overall, this is true in, in all the countries we surveyed. So certainly Iran is still seen as a, a significant um, threat to, uh, to the region and much greater than, than Saudi Arabia. So with that, I look forward to the, the comments of the panelists and, uh, and thank you very much. Thanks, Michael, and uh, thank you for the presentation. And, and it, it covered a lot of, of interesting ground. I guess one of the, the, the questions that, uh, that I would start with 
would be that this is a, a, a set of, of polling data that was collected by and large after the uh, pandemic and whether or not you saw anything significant in terms of how, uh, uh, how uh, individuals in these countries responded to countries based on, on issues related to the pandemic. I, you know, the Chinese, of course, uh, were very aggressive early on in trying to provide um, their, uh, their vaccine uh, around the world. There was a lot of soft power and we're gonna ask I think Marissa in a little bit to, to talk a little bit about her own um, uh, understanding of where the soft power uh, uh, um, ratios are. Uh, but, but did you see um, uh, any significant impact that, that the pandemic had on, on popular attitudes? So that's a great question. I think it's something that we did see. I'll just take the case of Morocco. We did see stronger attitudes. The United States has typically been relatively popular in, in Morocco compared with China, but we did see what looks like an increase in, in views towards China. And you can think about the fact that Morocco was really the leader in the region at getting early access vaccines, and mostly those were Chinese vaccines. And mm -hmm. so I think that there may be a link here with thinking about how China moved in and really made vaccines available at a time when perhaps the West wasn't. Um, at the same time, we did actually ask people who had not been vaccinated, what would your preference be for a vaccine? Um, and what we did see is that generally people said any vaccine that's available was the top one, but the other one that came through was really Pfizer. Right. And so it's interesting that in a way, um, I think that China reaching out certainly helped a place like Morocco, but there was a real preference over even Moderna or others, and it may be the kind of name of Pfizer or mm. some other piece of the fact that's, you know, the German-American cooperation or something, but it does kind of reflect the idea, I think more broadly, that there was a sense of, of what the U.S. did later on in, in trying to push vaccines may have actually in some ways helped the United States. And we do see a bit of a bounce back for the United States, mm -hmm. which obviously could be the change of administration. It could be some of the relations um, from COVID. Um, elsewhere for China, we don't necessarily see most of the countries, we see somewhat of a slide in, in the numbers that we do see for China overall. So I do think that it, it may have benefited in certain places like Morocco, but we don't necessarily see that across the rest of the region and, and the data. It's interesting. I mean, one of the things that struck me about the data was that, and you, you, you alluded to this in, in your presentation, even though um, in, in terms of the, the raw question of would you, are you more concerned about uh, economic ties to the U.S. or to China, uh, the, um, uh, the Chinese did somewhat better. Uh, there was less concern about that. And yet, when you drill down a little bit and talked about, you know, whose products do you prefer? Who would you rather work for? Who would you rather do business for, with? Uh, the U.S. and Germany you know, pretty consistently uh, came out ahead of, of the Chinese. And so it, it, it seems to be a bit of an oxymoron. I think that that's right. And I think one of the things that we, at least from the data that we can see, it doesn't necessarily seem that attitudes towards China are particularly well formed. We actually only started asking questions about China um, a, a few waves ago. I mean, it was not one of the countries we started with because they didn't necessarily have the presence. And obviously the Belt and Road, they've increased uh, very significantly their presence in men and most countries in the region have signed a, an agreement with China. And so I think it's something that is a new power. It is one that may not be defined. It is a power that's non-colonial in the region. There is a lot of, of potential you know, attractions with the, the economic model that China's presented over the last 40 years to increase the, well, the well-being of people in the country, um, and at least in terms of income. And so I think there's a lot there, but it is, as we're trying to drill down, trying to figure out why do we have this gap between what seems to be, as we really drill down perceptions of China, and the, the positive view overall. So it is something that we're really looking at to, to try and understand that gap. I think you know, one of the things we were looking at was thinking that there may be a link with, with the business because that's how China's engaged, but it is something we are actually developing new questions on to try and understand that. And I think particularly with the United States, uh, some of the things we presented, it's political policies are typically less popular. It's invaded a number of countries in the region. It um, certainly has, uh, you know, has a, a tie with Israel, which is, as we saw, not very popular. So I think, the fact that Americans or American companies are viewed more positively than America itself may make some sense, but I think we still don't necessarily have a, uh, a perfect grasp of why China is viewed more positively overall than it, it may be in the, the actual questions as we drill down. So something we want to look at continuing to go forward. Um, and uh, uh, Marissa, uh, we, had, we had mentioned that, that you've been doing 
your own work uh, looking at, at soft power issues and, and uh, particularly social media and, uh, mm -hmm. and related issues if you wanted to, uh, to jump in. Sure, yeah. First, thank you for um, having uh, for having me, for hosting this discussion, and, and kudos to the Arab Barometer for yet another wave of really important data. Um, I think starting with the point that Michael just mentioned with regards to China versus, versus the United States, and it's very much um, basically the Chinese are not militarily involved in the region. And so the United States continues to be viewed through that security slash military lens. And of course, more granular questions and data will showcase a more positive story when you talk about the American economy or American entrepreneurship or pop culture, et cetera. Uh, with China, there has been considerable investment, multi-billion dollars really, in their um, media machine and their soft power engagement with the region. Uh, we, we can talk a little bit more about COVID diplomacy um, and why they wanted to act so fast. Uh, particularly because of where the, you know, the pandemic started or the virus uh, originated. Um, but, um, you know, most of the, like the, you know, the, the Chinese uh, official news agency has coverage in Arabic. Um, they, the, there's CC or formerly CCTV, but Chinese TV in Arabic that, it, you know, broadcasts out of Dubai, Chinese anchors with perfect classical Arabic. Uh, so they're broadcasting in Arabic. This makes a huge difference. We don't really have data on viewership, but if you look at the social media pages, um, I think Facebook has over 18 million uh, followers, uh, less so on Twitter, maybe like around 700. And then their YouTube channel has a little bit less, maybe around 400,000. But those are significant numbers. And again, we cannot know where this is coming from, but it's, it's mostly from the region. Um, and it's all about how the issues are framed. I mean, if you just, if you click on the Chinese TV Arabic's website, and you just browse through how the developments in the world, particularly political developments in the United States, are being framed. It's a bit, bit of a critical, negative sort of, um, you know, framing. Uh, you look at their political cartoons. Um, there's, there, are, you know, stabs at the United States as well. So there's this anti-Western sentiment, and so people see that there's already this gruntlement in the region because of. U.S. military engagement um, yeah, in the region, uh, uh, as well as um, you know U.S. support to Israel. That's also a very important uh, lens through many people see um, see the United States. And so, when there is this context already, China's just harping on all of these messages. Interestingly enough, uh, Chinese Arabic channels and you know websites cover the Palestinian issue, very supportive of the Palestinian um, rights. Etc. But there's no mention of the Palestinian-Israel conflict in Chinese. So this is this is really very much geared towards the Arab audience. So it's tailor-made. Um, there is significant engagement with local press, with columnists, wherever they are. And so this is not just about oh, let's just launch a channel in Arabic. This is really very strategic, um, and that makes a difference in how people view China. The going back to the economic story. This is, I think, what they see as their forte. Uh, and you know, China's economic growth is impressive to many people in the region. Um, and, uh, but they also know the quality. When you go to the souks in Amman or in, even in, in Istanbul, and uh, uh, not in Arab country, but if you go to souks in the region, um, you will see a lot of Middle Eastern memorabilia made in China. So the traders are aware, they're, you know, in the market, they're aware of the of, of, of what China is providing. But the, at the same time, they see this um, massive great power uh, that um, also competes economically with the United States. So this great power competition component also emerges, um, I think, in, in those sentiments. And so, um, but the soft power projections and, and how it's organized is a huge part of the story. And of course, you know, there's a way in which the United people feel the United States is a known quantity. People have been dealing with the United States in the Middle East for decades. They've been dealing with it politically, militarily, culturally, with music and films and everything else. There's a way in which China is pretty unknown. Mm -hmm. Chinese music 
doesn't matter. K-pop, interestingly, mm -hmm. does matter. <laughs> but Chinese music doesn't matter. Chinese films, a few kung fu movies, but nothing real. China is a bit of a mystery. It's an alternative, a refutation of the status quo. And if people don't like the status quo, the United States secures the status quo. China's pushing against the status quo. And that gets China some attraction. It feeds into a history of anti-imperialism mm -hmm. in the region, which has been there since the days of the British. And China is happy to fuel it. The United States is has never quite been able to, to fully wrap itself in an anti-imperialist flag, despite the efforts of Americans to replace imperialism with something better. But there's a sense the Americans are still imperialists in the region. Um, you know, I think the, the other piece, and it comes up a little bit in what Michael and Mercer were saying, there's a certain agility to China in the region that the United States has lost. We're sort of big and lumbering, and you have to get the whole government and you have to, to get the approvals and the screenings. China moves quickly mm -hmm. in the region. And I think there's a way in which both government officials and, and publics admire that. I think China's challenge in the region, two really. One is they get a big halo from their performance, mm. but their COVID vaccine wasn't very good. Mm. And their economy isn't growing at 13% a year anymore, and it's not going to. Right. So there's a way in which the Chinese halo is a little less shiny than it had been. And the other challenge I think the Chinese are going to have, they're not really investing in the long-term future of the region. They're not investing in an economic transformation that involves upskilling the population and diversifying economies. China's much more in a mercantilist orientation. I think I'll, there are a lot of governments that resent what the United States is trying to do in helping these governments transition to what will be a new economy in the world in the next mm -hmm. 30 years that will profoundly affect the Middle East. How that second piece plays out, will the US figure out how to do this and get credit and help the Middle East economically transform to a global energy uh, transition? Will China get enough quick hits to build up its credibility by not insisting on the longer term strategic things the US is trying to do? I think that's like a next 10 year challenge. I don't know how that's gonna come out, but I think it's very important the US does have a mission to transform the Middle East. China avowedly has no mission to transform the Middle East. Will the Middle East be more attracted to somebody with a mission or somebody who just wants to give them something now? And I don't know the answer to that. But can I, I, I wanted to, to follow up with you, John, on, on some points that Marissa was making about China and again, <clears throat> the um, the success that the Chinese have had in presenting themselves in an attractive way through their use of, of media, social media. Taking all of your points about the Chinese, let me ask you about Russia. Um, the uh, now you know understanding, of course, that much of this data was collected before the invasion of Ukraine. Certainly, what we're hearing at least, um, uh, you know, in a general sense, is that the Ukraine invasion has not necessarily dented uh, the Russian reputation. In fact, some people are quite supportive of what the Russians are trying to do in the region. And one of the points that's made to us consistently is exactly the same thing, which is the success of RT Arabic, mm -hmm in presenting and projecting a very positive image of the Russians. And so if we are in, a, in what we consider to be a strategic competition with Russia and China, and the fact of the matter is that both the Chinese and the Russians are doing better than we're doing in projecting positive images of their policies, 
rightly or wrongly, how do we how do we address that, and how do we how do we compensate uh, for that? If we're if we're just um, exporting Fast and Furious movies, and they're you know busily exporting you know their political views, how do we how do we balance that, and how do we use um, uh, soft power? At, you know we can go back to. Uh, to all of the, the discussions that we used to have about soft power and American soft power, how do we get that back and how do we, how do we address that shortcoming? Um, you know, in many ways, they already get a diversity of American views. Number of people who watch CNN, Fox News. I had a dictator's father-in-law tell me in a track two meeting, I know exactly what Americans think. I watch Fox News. <laughs> I was in somebody's car in Saudi Arabia. They had Fox News on the radio, right? I mean, the reality is the nature of the United States is not only that everybody taps into our diversity of news and picks out what they like, but people have a sense sometimes mistaken for the context for what's going on. People follow American politics. I remember being in Egypt in 1992 and the sort of fascination with Bill Clinton, a young guy who was going to push out from office, a president who just won a war. And by the way, we've still got Hassan Mubarak and he's thinking about running again. How about we follow this American example? There's, I mean, I think we are in such a different place. I don't know if you've watched RT Arabic. I've watched RT Arabic. I've been on RT Arabic. It's not so delightful, right? <laughs> but it's a view. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a way we create a view because we're not a country that has a view. I think the way we engage is we help people understand the context, the nuance. I think. We have to understand we are present in their lives, whether we want to be or not. They feel like they can't escape us. We are the norm. I think we have to be a little more cautious about thinking we are also the savior and the light and we have the answer. Mm -hmm. But I think we have so many positive attributes that we're not even aware of that people see as positive attributes. I'll give you an example. I was doing dissertation research in the Egyptian Delta in 1994. I met a guy who came to Colorado to do agricultural studies in 1954. So this was 40 years earlier. He had lost all of his English. You know what he remembered? He remembered he had a professor who whenever he asked the professor a question, he said, why not? The only words he remembered in English are why not? <laughs> and that's what he associated with the United States, mm -hmm. right? And I think that, 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 that we lose sight of the power of our example, not because we tell people what their aspirations should be, but because we're useful to helping people accomplish their aspirations. China, in a very mechanical way, and say, oh, we'll do trade, we'll build this. But the sort of software of success, I think people still look to the United States, look to Silicon Valley. You saw when, when MBS came to the United States, he went to Silicon Valley. This is where people think about innovation. This is where people think about the future. The question is, is there a place in it for them? Can they capitalize on it? Will Americans give them a chance? But I think that, that the... The difference between the U.S. innovation culture and Russian or Chinese innovation culture is night and day. We're just not very good at understanding how we're understood because we keep thinking about matching and we don't think enough about differentiating. And as I say, not we don't have to inspire people. I think the Bush administration spent a lot of time trying to inspire people. People have aspirations. They think we're either irrelevant to their aspirations or undermining them. And I think that's what accounts 
for negative views of the United States. And if I may add just one point to this, I don't know if Michael, if this is a question that's asked, um, but if you ask anyone in the region about where they want to migrate, and I can tell you I've taken many Ubers this summer in the Middle East, <laughs> and I asked that question and everybody wants to leave. Um, they do mention the Gulf because mm -hmm. it's, you know, Arabic is a common language. There are opportunities there. You can go some places in the Gulf Arabic, it's not so common a language. <laughs> or that, <laughs> that is true. Those supermarkets, but It's yeah. my minority language. <laughs> um, uh, but people cite the United States. Nobody says they want to go to China or Russia. Uh, people cite the United States. They want to study in US universities, US colleges. Um, and I think, you know, what John was talking about in terms of what you know, innovation and entrepreneurship and what the U.S. stands for, this is very much uh, respected, particularly amongst youth that are completely connected, digitized. They have access to information that their parents don't have access to. So that's also a differentiation yeah. to keep and in I, mind. I just to add on oh, to that, please, we, we, do have a, we do ask the question, are you considering migrating? And actually, Jordan comes out on top this year of all the countries we surveyed. So <laughs> Which, which country? <laughs> Jordan. 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 Oh, that's interesting. Jordan. So our, my, my colleague, Mohammed Abu Falga, has, has written a report, which you can download on our website, which details it. But to your point, yes, mm -hmm. it is particularly the United States or Canada or the West, yep. and not so much to uh, to the Gulf comes in kind of second in some of the historical migration patterns uh, right. from, from St. Louis to the Gulf. It's true, but mm -hmm. still it is the West. To your point, that's the so let me let me follow that up uh, with with a question uh, uh, to to Marissa or John or, or Michael. Um, one of the things that struck me in the data was that of all of the countries that you asked about, there was a fairly um, I would say statistically significant difference between how people felt about regional powers versus how they felt about the great powers, and to a certain extent it almost seemed like there was a, a pox on all your houses attitude about the US, China, Russia, whereas Turkey came out reasonably well, Saudi Arabia came out reasonably well, um, even Iran. Although I wanted to ask you uh, about the, the sectarian breakdown on some mm -hmm. of these responses, because I suspect that a lot of it has to do with, you know, where, where you pray is where you sit or, sure. or whatever. But but Marissa, I, you know, how do you how do you see that that you know that people seem much more comfortable talking about the countries in their own neighborhood? Mm -hmm. That is that's not surprising because there's um, I guess a common identity card there. Uh, both Turkey and Saudi Arabia are Muslim countries. Um, Turkey, yes, its economy is suffering now, but you know, with Erdogan's rise to power initially, there was a very positive economic story. So people turned to Turkey uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a positive example of a Muslim country that has succeeded, that has had democratic elections where things worked. Of course, we've seen a regression in that, um, in that picture, but that's not something that most um, Arab publics are concerned with. Um, uh, you know, visa restrictions between many of the Arab countries in Turkey have been lifted over the years. So there's there's more Arabs visiting Turkey. Uh, there's more engagement, uh, more economic uh, co cooperation as well. Um, and then don't underestimate once again uh, the you know I guess what Erdogan did on stage once at the World Economic Forum, walking out on the Israeli Prime Minister at the time. Um, the flotilla, the Turkish flotilla, um, and, and, and basically the showdown there, those are very prominent in the memory of a lot of Arab people because that's what they see on TV. That's part of the big story that's being covered on a daily basis in their local uh, channels and, and pan-Arab media as well. Mm -hmm. It is. It is actually one of the interesting things that we found in this wave is that Erdogan still comes out ahead of all the leaders that we asked about, but he has actually declined fairly significantly from our last wave in a number of countries. And I think that kind of hits at your point about the historical legacy, mm -hmm. but also the responsive, I think, of what he's doing in Turkey, potentially the, the kind of greater authoritarianism that he may be showing, mm -hmm. or at least you know, a strongman type of a approach, and also the weakness of the economy. It does seem to have some effect that he, even though he's been a strong supporter of the Palestinians and, and other things, raised, it, it does seem that he's actually coming down as well. And 
I think we're seeing that somewhat, that both these countries have historically been viewed very strongly. They're not necessarily viewed as strongly as they were, but certainly to your point, there still is, I think, in our neighborhood, kind of the co, um, you know, co religionist co, I mean, just the, the relationship there is, is still fairly strong. I also just make one more point, and it's an obvious one, but I, just, I think it's important to note that in every country, if you look across the broad population, most people are pretty parochial. So the questions that seize us right. and that we, we can go really deep on and we think about a lot, we are skew points on the American political spectrum on, when it comes to these kinds of issues. And these kinds of concerns are pretty tangential to most people in the region. So people would have a sort of instinct and they have an instinct toward China, against the United States, whatever. But, you know, I think it's, we can over interpret how deeply they feel about these things because we feel deeply about them. And I think we do that at our peril. Right. And, and, and so that was, you know, that, that was kind of what I was trying to get at with, with the question, because if you look at, for example, at, at Lebanon, you know, what are Lebanese attitudes towards the United States? Uh, I would guess that it depends on which neighborhood in Beirut you're asking the question, right? I'm told there are places in Lebanon that aren't even in Beirut. Oh, well, right. uh, uh, we can we can discuss that further right. if you want. <laughs> well, maybe you go up to Tripoli, you go yeah. to Netan. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a very, yeah, yeah. It's, a, yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a, yeah. So, certainly so, there are strong, I mean, divides within the community. I think particularly you see that in Lebanon with the Christian community being right. significantly more supportive of, of the West. I mean, certainly this overview of the countries, I mean, it does miss a lot of the variation that we see. And I, I think it also hits at some that we see with um, a lot of these to kind of John's point. I mean, we do see in this section, there's often feedback on the survey that a lot of people just say they don't know. They don't, this isn't part of their daily lives. That the foreign mm -hmm. affairs piece is really not as central, and so it is in, in some place where we see a higher level of don't knows and, and so on. So I do think it is um, a place where there is kind of a general sense, and as you're heading at in Lebanon, we do see a strong ties among certain communities to Iran, amongst the Shia, amongst mm -hmm. the Sunnis, to more so to Saudi Arabia, you know, the Christians, particularly to the United States, things like that. We do see these strong divides. We see it in Iraq to some extent as well, but um, it is it is something that I do think is a bit more tangential to many people's lives in the region. And so it is a bit harder to tease out exactly what's driving some of this. I think a lot of it is just kind of an image of what these countries represent or what the people think it represents, but isn't necessarily as, as completely thought out as, as some of the other pieces. Right, and, and, and of course, I, I, I couldn't say in all honesty that if you asked a bunch of foreign policy questions to your average um, you know, punker in Philadelphia that you would get a, a really deeply thought response on and, and Philadelphia is a relatively more cosmopolitan place right than a lot of parts of the country yeah right yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for the defense of Philadelphia <laughs> <laughs> so um, but but uh, you know but but it goes back also of course I mean if you look at Libya so you're asking foreign policy questions of, of Libyans but are, are they uh, Libyans in the east and the west uh, you know what's their what what's their attitude towards you know uh, towards Islam, uh, political Islam, uh, very different attitudes, and that's going to impact their views of Turkey, for example, um, as well as the United States. Um, and and then uh, you know to to go back to this uh, to this point about authoritarianism, I mean, you know we have this interesting dichotomy, don't we? Because on the one hand. Yes, Erdogan's reputation has declined somewhat, but he's still popular in terms of, of where you uh, where you uh, place him on the on the overall picture. You you um, assess that perhaps some of the decline is attributable to his turn towards authoritarianism, and yet the Chinese model is often held up as uh, as one that that perhaps should be emulated by countries that are trying to get onto the development uh, uh, treadmill and 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 see the 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 repression of, of political um, differences as a as a positive element of the Chinese model right and it, it certainly it certainly is. I think there's a lot of tensions here. I mean, about personally, particularly thinking about what is the knowledge, what is, are people basing it on? And I, right. 
I do think to some extent the social media and some of the other you know, portrayals that, that China is a country that its economic model has lifted a huge number of people out of, of poverty. And I think that that's probably the main focus for people in the region is thinking, at least the countries we surveyed, is thinking through that more than they're potentially thinking through the political pieces. But also, um, there are challenges. We didn't ask it this way, but in the past we've asked, and for example, we asked Tunisians, what's the primary definition of democracy in your mind? And about half of people said it was um, essentially jobs for all. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is still a focus on the social pieces of, of social and economic pieces that I think China exceeds that a bit. And perhaps the point that Erdogan did initially help Turkey really transform from kind of economic crisis to something that was really a success story, mm -hmm. that, that may be a piece. So I, it is something that's tough to tease out in part because these are um, just getting the knowledge and figuring out how are these, these views determined is Turkey viewed in the exact same light as, as um, China and I mean certainly the United States is viewed perhaps on a different um, level as well as we've been talking about it is a much more known quantity. So I think there may be some slightly different um, metrics being used across the countries but certainly I think as more becomes known about China and even as what we're seeing in the data now I think there is as the growth rates may slow in China as perhaps some of these other issues come to bear as people have more interaction. Um, a few a couple of years ago we asked people and it's one of the interesting questions you do ask is what's your view of different people of different uh, nationalities? So we ask, you know, regardless of US foreign policy, are Americans good people? And we generally see a majority in countries say yes. We see a number of people say I've never met an American, mm. something like that. But we asked about China and we only did in Kuwait, unfortunately. Um, but there, over half of people said, I have no idea. And I mean, there isn't still this knowledge, I think, and this engagement to the same level. And I do think that as that increases, we will see more um, direct knowledge of China, and perhaps this kind of understand better how people are making that 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 assessment of China itself. But I, I do think there are probably somewhat different metrics based on either Turkish soap operas and the different view of China. I mean, just right. the, the ways that countries are, are formed and, and the views. You know, I'm, I'm finishing up a study on, on Middle Eastern views of the China model. First challenge is the Chinese say there is no China model. It's a Chinese experience. Chinese love being admired. They love being emulated. They don't really push a model. They're mm -hmm. very careful not to push a model. And when you go to folks in the Middle East and you talk about the China model, there's no serious work on what it actually entails. There, there, there aren't books about it. There aren't journal articles about it. There are newspaper columns that say, yeah, we should have success like China. We should do it. But, but they don't go beyond 800 mm -hmm. words. Now, in Washington, we spend a lot of time doing things in 800 words. But that's not because anybody thinks you can change the world in 800 words. But I think a lot of this China discourse really is limited to 800 word columns by columnists being they engage the columnists, they bring them over, mm -hmm. they have them talk about things, mm -hmm. they, they say nice things about China. I, I get that. But as a, an element in social, political, and economic transformation, A, I don't see China playing an active role. B, I don't see governments being serious enough to engage in it. And so it feels to me, it colors the discourse. It may give China an entree. It may open some doors for government to government stuff. But in terms of a genuine transformation, in terms of these states looking more like China, I don't see it. Does it help the Chinese sell surveillance equipment and people thinking about a China model? I'm sure it does. Mm -hmm. But do they use the equipment the same way the Chinese do? Do they want to? I think the Chinese are interested in making a sale. They're not really interested either in the stability and certainly in the future prosperity of countries in the region. That's that's fairly clear. I, I, but you know, I, I mean, it, it's funny because when you when you think about when you think about how China is perceived in in the region, it's not that different from the way the United States was perceived in the region a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. Because in those days, we had the benefit of not having to stake out strong political positions. Mm -hmm. We were not militarily engaged. We were able to, to leave all of those hard issues to the British 
while we, you know, built universities, which were wonderful, uh, where we provided missionary services that, that you know, saved many hospitals. lives, mm -hmm. hospitals and, and all kinds of things. So we were perceived in a very benign way that we were doing all these good things while the British were the ones who were, you know, sending their military into these places and, and bombing civilians and doing other things. Now the shoe's on the other foot. The Chinese in some way are taking advantage of our responsibilities in the region on defense and security and, and taking some unpopular political stances for, for reasons that we like to think are, are good. Um, and the Chinese can come in and sell, whether it's surveillance equipment or telephones or, or in, in, um, in Yemen, uh, the Chinese have basically driven all of the Yemeni producers of khanjars out of business mm. uh, because all of the khanjars in the market now are, you know, made with these cheap, you know, kind of plastic handles that the Chinese are churning out. Mm. And the good Yemeni, you know, uh, artisans can't compete anymore so so you know it, uh, that's that's what you get in the market now and, and jerry if i may add um, a point um also in, in agreement with john um it's too soon for many people in the region to see if all these economic initiatives are actually going to create jobs for the people um so this session is about international relations so this question is very specific to that but is that really the first thing on people's minds absolutely not it's the economy you know COVID-19 really um had a negative impact on part particularly youth unemployment in the region in many of the countries surveyed um and so whether these Chinese projects are going to you know create jobs for for the people will be a factor I think um in the future but one other point to add here is in addition to you know, China's media machine working its way through the region, you also have state-owned TV and state-controlled media that does not necessarily allow too much room for criticism because of great power considerations that many governments have to make. And that's one of the reasons why the issue of the Uyghurs, for example, is not maybe on too many people's radar, radar because it's not being highlighted in all the coverage had it be, had it been an issue you would have seen a very different reaction but it's not always front page news it may have been perhaps picked up by al jazeera um, here and there but is this prominent in the coverage or is it being really addressed not really I and mean, what officials have told me is when you cover the uyghurs the chinese come in hard and say knock it off mm -hmm. and the American attitude is, yeah, you're going to criticize, you're going to criticize. Okay, we'll make representations, we'll demarch you, we'll do, you know, what, as, as you've probably <laughs> done yourself. But there nobody comes in and says, this will be the end. And the Chinese come in really hard when you go across the boundaries, and the Uyghur issue is one of the issues, mm -hmm. where they will come down like a ton of bricks and government say, you know what? They have all these things they want to do with us. I'm not going to risk it for a two-minute story in the Uyghurs. Right. I wanted to talk a little bit. I mean, it, it kind of in the same in the in the same context. I wanted to talk about the normalization issue. And um, and again, I, it, it was interesting because you know only two, actually only one and a half of the states that have normalized with Israel were included in this um, in this set of, of uh, surveys, uh, really just Morocco. And the Moroccans have always been ambivalent about Israel in any event. I mean, they've never been um, a hard line um, anti-Zionist or anti-Israeli state. They've had relations more or less under the table with Israel going back to the very beginning. So it's not necessarily a surprise to see that the Moroccans have relatively mild views about normalization. Plus they got something that they really wanted uh, from us. But elsewhere, and, and you know, the other countries that you've surveyed, quite negative about this. Certainly there's anecdotal um, uh, reason to believe that in the UAE, in Bahrain, normalization is not popular with the people. 
popular perhaps with some private sector um, individuals who've been able to benefit, popular with the governments, but it doesn't enjoy broad support. Uh, and so uh, I, I guess a couple of uh, a couple of questions. One, um, you know, where where do you go, and to what extent do you see, um, you know, this popular sentiment being a inhibitor of uh, any kind of move forward on the Abraham Accords, any broadening of, of, of normalization? Are we, you know, is this for the people in the region um, going to be seen as another cold piece, uh, you know, kind of like we saw in Egypt to a larger extent, I think, than in Jordan? Um, and, and to what extent does this, because the US was such a strong advocate of the normalization process, including with the Biden administration, to what extent does that affect attitudes towards the United States? Those are, those are an important set of questions and I think one of the things that we are, are trying to understand better and I think it surprised us a bit that we had such as you're saying, you know, I mean, again, it's still the vast, the majority of people in both Sudan and Morocco say they do not support the normalization process, but again, those do stand out in important ways from the others. And the other places we see somewhat of a difference is in Lebanon, we see that Christians are more supportive of the process overall, that Kurds in Iraq are more supportive. So there are these pockets of populations that are more open, but other than that, generally fewer than one in 10 across the country surveyed. So I do think it is a challenge as we move forward to think about what that may mean and, and how it may affect the United States. But we do ask, we didn't present it here, but it, the vast majority of people when we ask, what is the, still the, the solution you prefer for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is to have a two-state solution across most of these countries. That's the, the either majority or plurality are saying that they want to kind of stick to the, the old plans. It seemed like they're, no one's pushing them at this point. Certainly the, the administration here is not. So there's a sense that, that returning to that, or at least you know a, a more a stronger outcome for the Palestinians would be necessary. And I think that that would still be necessary before many of the, again, not the governments themselves necessarily, but the populations themselves really support that. And so I think when we've asked certain questions, either open-ended or others, um, we have seen, seen that the, the United States, what they want the U.S. to do is resolve this issue, that that is something that at least for the region, the United States seems like it is in a position to do and it isn't really doing in, in I think the minds of people we also do see somewhat of a strategic relationship and not this way, but in a previous way, we asked people, what is the greatest threat to the region? And certainly the closer you were to Israel, the more likely it was that people said Israel itself in Morocco, no one really was that worried about Israel. Obviously it's distant. At the same time, those who said that maybe it would be good for there to be some engagement, not necessarily normalization, but um, this was before these agreements, that there was some strategic point in talking to Israel, but that was also higher in the places that were closer to Israel itself. So I do mm -hmm. think there is a piece of this that, that Again, majority of people reject this idea, but I think there is some acceptance that Israel um, does exist, that it needs to be kind of dealt with. And, and that is a kind of the strategic calculation we're also seeing here in this survey with the actual accords, um, or at least the beginning of accords in Sudan, so that people see some benefit coming from this. They're willing to accept that in that kind of trade-off, at least some of them in Sudan and, and Morocco. Mm -hmm. But I do think that Israel is really one of the key, the key way that citizens view it is really through this kind of strategic lens. What I've heard in the Emirates is the, the view sort of break down to a third, a third, a third. Mm -hmm. A third of the people support, a third of the people are indifferent, a third of the people are hostile. It sounds about right to me. Um, I think one of the interesting questions is, is that affected at all if Israeli policy shifts dramatically? It's a possibility that Netanyahu will not only win the election November 1st, but will have a more right-wing government than he had right. the last time, will, and this is, a, this is a genuine question, will that provoke a younger generation of Arabs to re-identify with the Palestinians or will continued corruption and aimlessness in the Palestinian community, the endurance of Mahmoud Abbas 14 years after his term extended with no signs of leaving, the whole transition, will, will young Arabs continue to say, I'm just done. Even though it's worse, I'm done with this issue. I have my own issue. I think that's actually a question. It's an important question. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't predict what the answer will be, but I think that we may well see these numbers move with a different Israeli 
And I'm not sure which way they'd move. No, that's a question. And if we go back, if we go back to the idea that that at the end of the day, most of these issues boil down to economics and what's the benefit to me. I mean, the interesting thing is that um, is that in the UAE, which has by far benefited the most mm -hmm. and was best placed to benefit from a relationship with Israel, most sophisticated economy, uh, most you know, open to, to trade and commerce, um, you still don't have a, a really positive uh, impact. We were in Bahrain a couple of weeks ago, and you know, as best we can tell, I, you know, uh, for the most part, it doesn't have popular support. People aren't coming out in the street in opposition to it. There aren't mass demonstrations, but people aren't sold on it either. But for this Nega Forum, one of the groups is on water and agriculture. That's right. And the Israelis are co-chairs of the group on water and, the Israel, of water and agriculture. The Israelis have been using water and agriculture as a diplomatic calling card for more than 50 years. Mm -hmm. And they are poised to do it in a Middle East, which is increasingly struggling with climate change. Mm -hmm. Does this create an opportunity where Israel can reach out and create jobs and improve economies and do all those things, maybe, maybe. But it, it seems to me that, that, that this is a question, and I'm glad Michael's going to be continuing to go out into the field and ask these questions. Mm -hmm. It's, I think, a potential moment of change. It is also a potential time in which <clears throat> the overall policies may drive people to say, no, we were right having hostility toward the Israelis all along. And I, I wouldn't, I, I have been proven, I've been proven wrong enough times in the Middle East that I think I know when I should back away from predictions. <laughs> and there's some things here where I think we're going to back away from predictions. Yeah. Well, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting because as you say, I mean, the Israelis are going to have an election um, just a little over a month from now uh, with uh, a lot of question marks about which way the populace is going to swing. And, and there we go. Although, I mean, in, in fairness, uh, Netanyahu was the one who saw the Abraham Accords as being, you know, in his in his best interest. So, uh, presumably, he will want to do what he needs to do in order to uh, to sustain them. Netanyahu always does what he needs to do. That's right. That's to the sustain, calling card of Benjamin Netanyahu to sustain his best interest. And, and if I may add Please, one, one point that John mentioned mm -hmm. with regards to, well, where is the Palestinian issue when you ask, you know, Arab people, but particularly youth, yes, the, the economy is first uh, dealing with corruption, etc. So it's not really on the top of the agenda, but then every time there's a flare up in the Palestinian territories, whether it's the West Bank or in Gaza, or even between, you know, Israeli Arabs, um, in Israel, um, you you will see a resurgence of the sentiment. You see a lot more criticism, of course, of Israel on social media, uh, very much representing where people are at. So, the even though we, we're not seeing massive protests and demonstrations in front of the Israeli embassy or the American embassy with regards to the Abraham Accords, um, I mean, today is the second year anniversary, right? It is of, indeed. Of the Abraham Accords. Mm -hmm. um, people are, may not come out and, you know, be critical because I think they understand why the United Arab Emirates in particular has taken that path. They understand the geopolitics and geoeconomics, um, you know, the context. Um, but to them, the issue, the elephant in the room is the Palestinian-Israeli issue. Uh, and if this is not resolved, then why are we normalizing relations in Israel? Um, Anti-normalization um, movements in, in Jordan and, and perhaps in Egypt as well don't know too much about what's going on in Egypt on that front, but they're pretty strong through professional associations and syndicates. Um, they're very prominent. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's beyond just the dividends of peace that many people did not get to. But, but the governments manage them. They're used to managing them. Yes. I think they instrumentalize them. I mean, to me, I certainly, for decades, have known a generation for whom Palestine was not a political issue, it was a moral issue. 
I can't tell whether there's that same moral conviction, the, the sense that, that, that Palestinians are the manifestation of injustice mm. in the world. I don't know how that is among 20-somethings mm. who are watching all kinds of media, who are distracted, who have a different attitude toward the news. You know, one of the things that's changing a lot is people are getting the news from TikTok. Now, I wonder what news are you getting in 15 second bites? Right. And, you know, it's the, the Johnny Depp trial is, is what counts as news. And believe me, I met some young women who were transfixed by the news of the Johnny Depp trial that they followed on TikTok. What does that mean for Palestine as news? And to me, that's a question I don't know the answer. My sense is that it's less visceral it is less moral, whether that can be sustained, whether it will be sustained. I, again, that, to me, that's a, it's a question I think we have to think about through different parameters than we thought about it before. I don't think it's a yes, no question. But I, Michael knows I, the answer. I, 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 I will say, I think one of the challenges we do find on the survey when we talk with the interviewers who do this, they really somewhat dread the question about Israel because they know that it's going to explode on that with kind of anger. So, they really say, do we really need to ask this many questions at once? So I think that it is kind of hitting at that piece that there is a real emotional piece mm -hmm. of that issue that still exists. And whether it exists with everyone, I think it could be changing to some extent. Yeah. But it is the piece that they always kind of ask us, can we cut this down? Can we take it back? We, we want to ask questions, we want to document that. But again, when we ask an open ended question, what's the biggest challenge, the key challenges facing in your society? It isn't something that like this really comes up in most of the countries. It isn't something that's a top of mind issue. But there is a real, at least from what we see, and when we talk to the the teams, we were asked about this. Have you done sort of a, an analysis to understand the kinds of people for whom that's the explosive issue that blows up the interview? You no, know, that's actually a great issue. We have not done that, but it would be worth just mm -hmm. having a, a mark that this was ended up being not just based on the answer, but it was kind of more kind of diatribe against the, the situation. I would be fascinated to know how these people are different from the population as a whole if, if it's a, a minority. I'd be interested who is that minority. And, it, and by the way, wouldn't, yeah, I'd be interested in the gender breakdown. I think people have depoliticized women really inappropriately in the Middle East. The boycotts are all led by women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a way to, to belong. I mean, the, the, the politics of this issue are very interesting. Mm -hmm. they're, they're dynamic and they're important. Uh, but let me, uh, we'll, we'll uh, uh, open the uh, questions up to the audience in, in a minute, uh, but uh, let me let me ask you before we do that, uh, one question for, for all of you, and that is, you know, looking at the polling data, looking at where, you know, where the U.S. is, what attitudes are towards the United States, vis-a-vis -vis the, the great power competition, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, uh, our economic uh, relationships, if you were advising the administration, and uh, some of you are, but if you were, um, what advice would you give to, to change? I, I think that, you know, and in and, and fairness, and, and, we should, and we should clarify, I mean, you know, after all, this wave was undertaken uh, beginning in October of last year, uh, running until July of this year. And so in fairness, um, you were out in the field asking people questions about Joe Biden when he was um, not not even a year into his uh, term. So you know a, a lack of, of knowledge and clarity about where he's going is understandable. But um, but what would you what would you say to to Joe Biden about about how the U.S. is perceived and how to to change that? <laughs> don't don't oh, I'll, I'll tell you the advice I've given the administration. Um, the energy transition is going to profoundly transform the Middle East over the next two decades. It will be the principal external force that will reshape the political economies of the entire region, both the oil exporting states and the labor exporting states. Nobody will be unscathed by this transition. 
the economies will have to diversify. Mm -hmm. The role of the state and its relationship to the populations will change profoundly. And we have an interest in helping our friends navigate this. The Chinese are not going to do it. They don't have the interest. They don't have the tools. They don't have the credibility. And I think that a large part of the focus of what we're doing should be to offer to build partnership to help states navigate this change. Some will take it up, some will not. Some will be successful, some will not. I get it. But I think if the region fails broadly, we're all going to have a problem. I think the world's going to have a problem, whether it's migration, extremism, I can imagine any number of things. And I think we have a real interest in building genuine partnerships. Can't force them to do what they don't want to do. But acknowledge that they have aspirations and be helpful, effective in dealing with their aspirations. And that needs to be as important an element as the military security component that we're still going to do because it's in our interest. But we have to we have to have a balance and part of that balance has to be how are we going to end up in a place in 30 years that leaves us all a little more secure. Right. Right. And, and we'll have a chance to drill down on, on some of those questions in the next few weeks. Uh, next uh, next week, we're going to talk about the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, the week after that, uh, gender. And we'll close up with the other um, aspect of this, John, uh, which is climate and uh, climate change. So, uh, so we'll be looking at uh, our barometer data on all of those issues going forward. Yeah. I, I will say one of the things that does surprise me each way that we do this where we potentially see a transition, I mean, the, the amount that the United States seemed to increase fairly significantly in, in terms of popularity just simply with the change of administrations would be my best estimation mm -hmm. of the actual cause. There is still this kind of renewed hope that America could be different, that there is some sense that America could renew itself. I was in, in, I was living in Jordan at the time of Obama's election. I remember kind of the excitement that we had this, this new president who was coming in, Barack Hussein Obama. And, and things like that, that there was this excitement. And I think that there is a chance that the United States has to potentially change that. But I do think it goes back to this idea of, of having the United States really doing things that people see that might actually be, you know, helping these transitions. And I, I know the United States does give a lot of aid. I don't know if you have this way, but they do give a lot of other forms of aid, you know, more than, the, than some of the other uh, global powers. But I do think it is a sense that having to win hearts and minds, it would really require transformation, I think, insofar as the United States is linked with kind of that power structure that there is and linked with some of these issues, it is going to be a challenge. But there is, I mean, again, I think it's kind of the hope that, that each administration, not every administration, but certainly some of the administrations that come in really do get a kind of balance initially in the hope that they might actually change some of these either policies or really be more on the side mm -hmm. of citizens in terms of helping them. Um, stand up for, for governments and or stand up against their governments in some ways on some of the issues. So it, it will be a challenge. Though. I mean, it is obviously a long history, and I think one of the things that we can do is really change the long term narrative that we can see the bump that comes um, this way. Yeah. Marissa, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll keep it um, simple, maybe a little bit cheesy, but, <laughs> um, but uh, I think staying true to um, American values. Um, I think that's what people respect about America, uh, particularly when they see or engage with America and American people through what America is really known for. Um, so support for programs in entrepreneurship, um, youth development, women, and not, again, not to, uh, as John said, not to tell them what they need to do, but really support their local efforts because there are transitions happening within these societies. Um, and it's interesting to see what's happening at all levels. Um, and so the key is to plug in and support a lot of these initiatives uh, beyond just working with government and maintaining stability for the, for the sake of stability. Because uh, the status quo is not going to stay as is. Um, mm -hmm. If we don't see it, you know, things regressing, it's because we, you know, we don't see the support 
coming in um, and really America standing true to its values. Right. Thanks. Um, let's let's take questions from from the audience. And and again, if you're watching on um, on the screen, uh, you can use the chat function to uh, to ask a question. Uh, we do have one question from from the audience, um, uh, the virtual audience. Uh, that I'll, uh, what I'll I'll ask you, Michael. Uh, the the question is about Egypt and and the extent to which uh, Egypt's uh, response has turned up. And I, I assume that uh, going forward, there will be more of of the Egyptian um, uh, Egyptian uh, questionnaires in in subsequent conversations. But uh, you had mentioned early on some of the countries you didn't ask some of these questions of others so so if you could talk a little bit about the mechanics sure. of of the project so it's it's a great question we we and during the time of covid we switched to phone surveys and we found that as we did some experimentations there was some bias in in the phone surveys in terms of how re people responded um, and so on particularly sensitive questions that there may be some sense that that some of the governments were listening and these weren't necessarily the same differences across countries so one of the things and we didn't actually find this in tunisia to a significant extent which at the time was before the events of a, a year ago july mm -hmm. and so on and so you do see that there are mode differences and so one of the things that we realized is that for the sensitivity of a lot of the questions we have we really want to do it in a person's place of residence where they may have a greater ability to speak freely to try and uh, deal with some of the challenges of working under authoritarian governments and so Again, not to say phone surveys don't have a use, they do, but again, it, it, there is a difference. So we have to work to get permission in a number of the countries to do this type of work. And, and Egypt um, was one of the countries where unfortunately lost the, the international relations battery there. I think that it was deemed as too sensitive to get us permission. And again, this is really for the health and safety of both the respondents mm -hmm. and the interview team, because if we're doing mm -hmm. things that are not um, permitted, and again, I think it's a real tragedy. We want to have the data. We work to get the data. We try and push back and try and show the value of having the data. But we can't always get that data. And so in this case, we didn't. Egypt will be included in all the other presentations. We have data on the other the topics, but unfortunately, we, we can't do that. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Um, uh, let's let's uh, begin with uh, a good friend. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'm Dave Pollock. I'm at the Washington Institute. Thank you very much for fascinating presentation. I, I want to offer, it's not really a question, it's just a, a very brief uh, series of points that by way of an update and an expansion of some of the work that you've been doing based on comparable surveys that I've been doing. And so one, one uh, that are uh, a little more recent, um, and in particular, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, where we have actual hard data from many of these countries and from some Gulf countries. And um, the, the, what we see is, and I'm responding to some of the comments that you made, Jerry, that, that the, it's not that the people in these Arab publics agree with the Russian invasion of Ukraine or accept that, no. In fact, the data show very clearly that three quarters uh, in Gulf and in Egypt, Jordan, and in Egypt and Jordan, uh, Lebanon is a special case, uh, oppose it. Um, and two thirds blame the Russian invasion of Ukraine for the rise in food prices in their own country across the board. It's not that, but at the same time, they around half still say that good relations with Russia are important for their country just about the same percentage as we'll say that about the US or China. So they're not pro-Russian, you know, on Ukraine, but they still think that Russia is an important power that they have to deal with, that their country has to deal with. That's one thing. And what I also heard is we have no dog in this fight, although they use an Arabic expression that involves camels. But they say this just isn't our issue. That's your issue. It's don't, not, don't drag it's us not, into the issue. It's not their issue, but they have yeah. an opinion about it. Yeah, yeah. Their opinion about yeah. it is negative. They do not support the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And that's a misconception, despite all the very, very crafty Russian propaganda that mm -hmm. I know exists mm -hmm. on the media, on RT, and social media, and everything else about this. That's one. Number two is about Iran. I, I, I might have missed some of this, but I think it's very important to underline 
that the hostility, suspicion, fear of Iran is not just something that the Arab governments or elites have. It is very much the case at the popular level as well, almost across the board in Arab countries, except for the Shia in Lebanon. And in the Gulf, for example, uh, even the Shia in Saudi Arabia or in Bahrain or in Kuwait, and even in Iraq also are hostile toward Iran and yeah. don't oh. believe today, right now. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, that, that, that's what we have in our survey too. Is, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that and they clearly... don't believe that good relations with Iran uh, in general, only a small minority, mm -hmm. even of the Shia in most of those countries, uh, maybe especially, right? Mm -hmm. Don't believe that good relations with Iran are important to their country. Uh, that that's that hovers around the ten or fifteen percent range. In, in Finally, about normalization with Israel. Uh, very briefly, because the surveys that um, I've done, I think, complement yours from in in the Gulf countries. Uh, we have actual hard data from the last couple of years from the UAE, from Bahrain, uh, from Saudi Arabia, even from Qatar about this issue. And uh, what they show is, and it doesn't matter if it's before a war in Gaza, after a war in Gaza, it doesn't matter uh, statistically, that around 40%, it, it's a mixed picture, around 40% of the people in Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, even in Qatar, say that it's OK to have relations with Israelis. Uh, and by comparison, after decades of official peace with Israel, only 10% of the people in Egypt or Jordan mm -hmm. agree with that. So what you have is actually more grassroots support for relations with Israel, a lot more, even though it's not a majority, but a lot more acceptance at the popular level in the Gulf countries than you do in Egypt and Jordan these days. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's come over here. We only have a few minutes left. Here, here's, uh, here's the microphone. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Faris Salmari. I work at the Washington Institute. I'm a research assistant in the org for Dr. David Paul. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. It's in Germany. We did not plan that. Um, but um, I just have to. Uh, and this, thank you for this. This was really interesting. Um, my questions aren't interesting, but I was curious. So when you're comparing the perception on countries, uh, China, I'm sorry, your President Biden, Xi, uh, MBS and Erdogan, you chose head of states or head of governments, but MBS isn't the head of uh, government officially. I know many analysts consider him, you know, de facto role, but I was just wondering, uh, is there a specific reason for that? Why didn't you choose King Salman? And um, I just noticed that there was, you know, the Gulf states are missing from this. Uh, do you mm -hmm. have any plans on uh, doing surveys similar to this in the Gulf? So thank you, those are, those are two great questions. I think on the first one, I mean, given the, the front forward role and particularly in, in the, the region that MBS is playing, we decided to go with him instead of, of uh, Mohammed Salman. We also um, did the same with NBZ before he actually um, said that he was uh, you know, part of it was trying to figure out who was actually the figurehead that people would recognize more so um, directly. And again, this is uh, not to say that, that the actual head of state doesn't matter, but um, it was the person who was kind of the ambassador of that country. Um, policies are associated with policy. Um, you're free to disagree with me, but, uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, but again, I mean, we're trying to do the best we can. And I think um, we do make decisions that are a bit controversial, not as entirely consistent. We're not trying to make sure that we're getting the best data on who we were thinking of as the leader. Given the, the dynamics, so that's the reason. On the second one, yes, we do. We have data on Kuwait. Um, this is a country we do consider to have a relationship with us. Because it can have questions about their relations. Unfortunately, that's uh, fortunate. We we had this in the past where we just kind of had a region that was uh, relatively cool. It is our goal to get more of the countries we have. In the past, we've done Syria and Saudi. I think you know, part of our challenge is just making sure we're getting fair access. We do want to make sure that the countries get the information that they want to get from 
years ago, they offered a lot of asymptotic push and go around the country. That country in the end, but it is, I think, a valid question for the freeway because we don't really have the resources to make it just fun to show some leader has 107 percent of the board. I think you're doing a great job. One thing that's worth noting, and I, I think it's not been noted enough, Gulf governments are increasingly interested in doing their own work to understand mm -hmm. where their Absolutely. populations are, whether it's polling, sentiment analysis of Twitter, other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, I've had conversations with folks in a number of countries, and it is so clear that they feel it is essential that they have their finger on the pulse of where the mm -hmm. public is, and they argue that they do it so well they don't need election, right? And I've had and I've had leader I've had conversations with leaders in the region who talk about how elections polarize people and get people to do crazy stuff, and they feel I think they feel it genuinely that their system of the polling, the sentiment analysis, all those things gives better results and better representation of the people's views than this democracy foolishness. But they are increasingly interested, and I'm sure there's a huge amount of polling going on precisely the kinds of things you care about. Absolutely, and so it is one of the things there are, again, a lot of these, these governments do have organizations, as, as you're saying, that actually are doing this work, and I think we want to want to do it. I mean, it, one of the challenges we did face in, in the past is we reached out, we were talking with the Minister of the Interior of all these countries who said, you know, I, we know our dirty laundry, we don't need the world to know. Part of the challenge is we make our data public, and it is something that goes in research. I think there is a real danger there in providing people, but we have had positive outreaches. We've actually started having some back conversations to see if we can actually increase this. And again, we want to make sure we have everything in place that we can do this under our not under other terms. So, it is something that we are making very concerned about to get in such an important region. It's something we want to do. Again, as researchers, we, if, if to your point, if it works so well, people are that happy, that will come through. And I mean, honestly, Kuwait looks much better than the others. But again, there shouldn't be anything to fear if that's true. The best conversations I've had in the Middle East are with royal pollsters. And, you know, and part of their job is to tell the truth, right? And they have so much interesting understanding of nuances and stuff. It's, it's sometimes mm -hmm. hard to find them, but when you do, boy, hold on, it is fascinating. <laughs> on that note, on that note, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, especially to, to Michael Robbins and our barometer for uh, coming here and sharing their data with us. Uh, all very interesting. Uh, thank you very much to John Alterman from CSIS and to Marissa Horma from the Wilson Center uh, for joining and uh, participating in this conversation. Again, uh, we will on the 15th, uh, uh, on the 22nd, uh, we will have a conversation with our barometer about the economic findings on the 30th of September, we will have a conversation on gender uh, issues. And on the 6th of October, 6th, right? 6th of October, uh, we will have a final conversation looking at attitudes about climate change, which should be fascinating. Mm -hmm. So thank you again. Thank you for those who came today here, as well as everybody who was tuning in. Um, on the screen. Thank you.